Hey everyone, it's Rami again, and I'm back with another keyboard video. This time, I did a really interesting one. Uh, this is a Zenith Data Systems Z150. So this is an old XT keyboard. Uh, I, this is like before my time. Like I'm used to the Focus 2001 and like those kind of keyboards that have the 101 key, uh, like Win key list and stuff like that. But AT keyboards, those are the ones that I used when I was a kid. This is before even that. This one is even more different than the Model M actually because this, uh, you can't just use a Soros converter on this. Uh, you actually have to, you know, like use uh, the keyboard with the original computer it came with because that's the only one that supports this. Or build your own converter, which I had to do because I don't have the original computer. So it was a pretty fun restoration project I did on this thing. I cleaned out all the switches, every single one of them. I retro brighted all the keycaps. And I, I just wiped the whole thing down with Windex and cleaned out the inside. It was pretty freaking dirty when I got it, but it's like almost brand new now. It's amazing. It turned out great. And I built a converter for it, for USB. Um, I did it the, you know, plug side. You see, I like this cable. This is a thick ass cable and I wanted to make, I wanted to be able to use it instead of having, you know, like some people do, they would just chop it off and stick a USB cable. Nah, using the original shit here. <laughs> Anyway, so I'm gonna tell the story how I did this because it was really fun and hopefully if you ever get one of these keyboards or like a leading edge which has, you know, similar problems reading, uh, hopefully this will help you like build a converter for it if you ever need it. All right, real quick, I'm just gonna do a review before I dive into the restoration process. So ZNF uh, was an American company. It was founded way back in 1918. They go back pretty far. And uh, I think they started off making like radios and stuff, and they also made TVs. Uh, they're well known for inventing the TV remote. Uh, that's probably like their biggest claim to fame. But uh, I think sometime in the 70s, they bought out Heathkit, and uh, they became Zen uh, Zenith Data Systems. And that's when they started making computer products and stuff. And I don't know the name of the computer this keyboard came with, but it was an XT keyboard running on an 8088 and they used these uh, green alps. These green alps are the first uh, alps in the entire SKCL and SKCM series. So yeah, they're, they're, they're really old. These are very, they're usually found in these XT style keyboards with these older layouts. And al uh, pretty much every single Zenith keyboard from this time used these uh, linear Alps. Zenith had several contracts with the US military and um, holding these keyboards you can kind of feel like they're really like military grade keyboards. The back here is a heavy metal plate. This thing is really heavy. It weighs a lot and it gives the keyboard a lot of weight. I think this weighs like maybe two kilograms. It's, it's very hefty and the cable itself is thick as hell. I think this might be the thickest cable I've ever seen on one of these older keyboards, more than the Model M. It's crazy. And uh, it feels like a Northgate Omnikey, like the build quality is very good, I love it. But unlike the Northgate Om Omnikey, it only has four screws in the back, so that leads to this thing caving in a little bit, which the Northgate does not do. The Northgate is solid as a brick and up here, which I kind of don't like that, you know, but it's, it's excellent otherwise. Also, another weird thing is they don't have homing bumps on F and J like most keyboards do. Uh, that also is really hard for me to get used to. I always lose my, my row, <laughs> my typing. Also... These Alps have LEDs inside of them, so when you push these, the LED shines through. And that was a characteristic of linear Alps, because they didn't have room for like a tactile or a click leaf. They would put the cutout and the, actuals, uh, and the actual switch so you could see the LED through it. Very interesting design. And this keyboard also has an internal beeper because of uh, the fact that these are linear switches. Uh, the IBM's keyboards really popularized that click, that audible click, and so for these keyboards, that's why the beeper is in there, because these are just linear. There's no tactility or any feedback. So, this keyboard arrived pretty dirty and yellow, 
but it appeared to have seen very little use. Like, it seems like it just sat in the sun pretty much for most of its life. Uh, the keycaps still had their nice texture, and the switches were still very smooth. One, like, one or two were scratchy, but that's about it. It's really, like, overall great condition. But, so what I did was I just, you know, I opened the entire keyboard, and I, you know, I, I unscrewed everything and took all the keycaps off. The keycaps themselves are actually made by Alps, and uh, you can actually notice the Alps uh, keycaps just by looking at the molding, the double shot molding there. Those are nice, classic OG Alps double shots. Uh, very nice um, keycaps. And I knew they were in good condition because ABS caps shine easily, and these ones were still not shined, very, very much not shined. And you could also tell that the keyboard was made by Alps just by looking at the back of the PCB. Uh, this keyboard uh, had has one of the nicest chassis I've ever seen. Uh, it's very, very, it's built very well. Uh, you can see the Alps logo right there, uh, made in Japan by Alps, uh, which is you know a Japanese company. And yeah, anyway, so yeah, I just took everything apart down to the key assembly, and the keycaps were were I, I took every single one of them off and cleaned them, revealed the nice array of green alps looks like a bunch of green emeralds <laughs> and yeah uh, i put the keycaps aside and i just got started on the process of cleaning the switches and uh shout out to heroes ran 22 i learned this process from him uh, he has a great tutorial on how to clean alps switches you just pry them open with tweezers you know very carefully and you pull on the top housing and then they'll come right out and this is a very, very, very time-consuming process, doing this to every single switch. But at the end of the day, it's rewarding because it really does feel a lot better. And so, yeah, I cleaned out every single switch just like this with the brush and every single switch part, the the slider, the housing, the, you know, I, you know, all the, the, the bottom housing. And I put it together and it felt amazing. All of them felt amazing afterwards. And uh, additionally, I just vacuumed out the whole mounting plate. It was actually very clean to begin with, but I just did that anyway because I always make sure everything is as clean as possible with these keyboards because uh, Alps really feel terrible when they're not clean. It's just a, a thing, you know, I gotta, I gotta warn everybody for it. Anyway, after that, it was uh, time to start the RetroBrite on the keys because I normally don't like doing RetroBrite. But I really, really do not like typing on piss yellow keys. And so I I really didn't get enough good weather for these uh, keycaps. It took a long time uh, to get like a good day. And, but I was just being impatient and putting them out in cloudy weather like an idiot. <laughs> and it was being so dumb. And I got it all over my hands. Don't get this stuff on your hands. It's just not good. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't look good. It's not like, you know, dangerous, but it's just not good. It's it's uncomfortable. But yeah, eventually I got a good day and I did the whole clear submersion method and I put out in my backyard. Uh, that might not have been the best idea because there's a ton of animals back there. And I, I, I was watching this robin right here closely, afraid that it was going to dive bomb my retro bright. <laughs> I was worried more for it than for the keys, to be honest. But anyway, the keys turned out great. Look at that. I kept the spacebar yellow as a control. Also because it was so freaking huge that it didn't fit in the bag. These spacebars are gigantic. I don't know why. Look how big that is. You can tell it's much bigger than your average spacebar. But yeah, eventually I got that one retro too. And I, you know, started putting the keyboard assembly back together. Uh, putting a spacebar on, on Alps as a... Uh, Pretty much on all keyboards, the space bar is a pain in the ass. So here's my method. I just put it on with the stabilizer dangling, and then I clip it in place manually like that. It works great, especially for this gigantic ass log of a space bar. <laughs> and then, yeah, so the process of reassembling is pretty simple. It's the same thing you did when you took it apart. <laughs> you just, yeah, plug whatever stuff back in, you know put it back in the chassis this particular chassis is amazing it's like I mean it's what you would expect of an old Alps chassis these things are built like absolute tanks and this one being a military military grade keyboard is yeah it's what you would expect 
And yeah, I don't like these nuts here. These are uh, flathead screws, but they're like, I hate using flatheads. So luckily they have a hex, and so I'm going to use a nut driver to put them in there, just like the Model M. It's not the same size as the Model M. It's slightly different. But listen to this freaking plate. This thing is amazing. This thing is like... Yeah, it's like a freaking frying pan. You could like fry an egg on here. Like if you're missing your frying pan, just use one of these damn things. <laughs> it's it's really nice. But the one thing I hate about this build quality is these damn screws. These are actually self-tapping screws. And my method here is to just screw them in the other way until you hear a pop. And then you, you start uh, screwing it in. That way you know that it's actually falling into the right threads. Uh, I learned this trick from Adrian Black, uh, Adrian's Digital Basement. Yeah, yeah, with the Macintosh screws or some one of those computers. Anyway, keyboard is built and it's time to do the USB conversion. I mean, the keyboard is restored. I didn't build it. <laughs> so, I went to PR, pjrc.com and ordered a Teensy 2.0 because that's what I, you know, that's what I heard was how you use how you convert these things that's how everyone's doing it so I grab myself one of these really tiny little circuit board it's a microcontroller that you can just flash any program onto I'm not a programmer so I have not I'm no skills in whatsoever I had to find someone else's program so for that I went on to desk authority and not only did I find the the hex file I needed I find I found all kinds of pinouts and, and useful information on there and documentation from people who had done it themselves previously and so I went to you know I just browsed the whole thing and just on this one page I will link this in the description because it's very helpful I found this uh, firmware right here already pre-programmed and ready to go so you just take that and you launch it onto the Teensy you load it on there with the Teensy loader and then you solder the wires to the respective pins uh, reset goes to B7, fi uh, 5 volt goes to VCC, data goes to D0, ground goes to ground, and clock goes to D1. And I have this example right here with the teensy pins on the bottom of the of the pins and the XT pins at the top. And here's the pinout for the teensy uh, in case, you know, anyone here ever wants to do it. And I will link all the resources in the description. And here's my work. Uh, you can see that I am absolutely god awful at soldering. <laughs> uh, they're not shorting. I made sure that they're not. They're, they've got plenty of room, you know. But um, yeah. So as I mentioned, I like to use the actual cables. So I've got these XT sockets in the mail, and I wired them up here. Those uh, those resistors are important there. Look at that one. That one's barely even held on by a thread. But you need these resistors because they, um, I actually don't know why, but yeah. Anyway, this is what happened when I first loaded it up. <laughs> it wasn't working. But then I, I removed the short and uh, that fixed it. That got everything working. I, when, I, when, I, when I separated it with some paper, we have a winner. My name is Jikis. I am type. Oh fuck! No, no. Look, it works. Just, just, just look at that. So thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. I had so much fun with this project. I've just been going down a crazy rabbit hole with keyboards and stuff. I, I, I love keyboards a lot. I've loved them my whole life since I've had my first mechanical keyboard. And this one has just been an awesome one, and it's very fun. I typed up the whole script on this keyboard for this video, as I did with the Model M video. And, yeah, I really, really appreciate everybody watching, and I appreciate all the support everyone's given me. And uh, just want to give a shout-out to KairosRan22 and uh, DeskThority. Everyone on there is just doing all these crazy projects and... The stuff that I did is barely, it barely scratches the surface of the cool stuff they're doing on there. And yeah, anyway, that's about it. I'll catch you next time. And here's a typing demonstration on the Zine Z150.